All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Sorry, we are a couple minutes behind. Of course, nowadays, everyone's working remotely. So, of course, we're going to have a few technical difficulties. But thank you for bearing with me and welcome to the May edition. It's like this is the third remote edition of our monthly virtuous training webinar. Today, we're talking about taking your automation to the next level, how you can communicate with your supporters in a multi-channel approach, right? How to have that conversation with them and not limit yourself just to email. And I'll say, I, I have an opportunity to talk to a lot of clients about working with automation. And a lot of times, uh, you know, there's really kind of a, an emphasis or a focus on email solely, but uh, automation's more than just email. We've actually talked about that in some previous editions of this very webinar where we've looked at how you can use automation to drive internal processes like major donor prospect identification and uh, the qualification and cultivation process and how you can even use it to manage your data internally but today we're going to look at still communicating but uh, across some different channels now before we get started as always there are a few quick ground rules uh, first off, we are recording today's session as we do each time, and we will be making this available on our Training Academy page, as we always do. That will be posted by tomorrow, so that if you do want to share anything from today with your team, you'll be able to do that. As always, because we want to get some nice, clean audio for today, hopefully the audio is good. Uh, but uh, because we want to get that audio nice and clean, we have muted everyone, as is usual on a webinar like this. But we do want to answer your questions. At least I do. That's kind of what I do. I'm a trainer. So if you do have a question as we go through, if something comes up to you, if you just have a question about Virtuous, maybe it's not even about uh, automation or multi-channel automation, just go ahead and use that Q&A box. You can send in your question. You'll just type it into that box. We're going to hold those questions until we get to the Q&A session. Um, and then we'll be able to address all of those at the same time. But as we go through, if you have a question, certainly fine to just go ahead and type it in. That way you can get to the front of the line. Uh, for those of you who do not know who I am, my name is Scott Richards. I am the Director of Training and Education here at Virtuous. You've probably at least heard my voice on some video somewhere at some time, if nothing else. And uh, today, as usual, we have a pretty good chock-a-block uh, agenda that we want to go through. As always, we want to look at some of the newest features in Virtuous. Feels funny, we're getting ready for another release, but we're talking about some of the features that were in our previous release, like the new receipt editor, the ability to embed video in email, or at least sort of embed video in email a little bit more easily, uh, and the new pending contacts area, which is certainly coming to the fore now that a lot of folks are starting to use more lead forms and do more online fundraising. Then we'll look at our featured content, right? When is email not enough? And how to use the letters on demand feature as part of your automation strategy. Uh, and then we'll have some time to ask the trainer before we wrap up for another month here. Okay, uh, but first we want to look at some of those latest developments in Virtuous as advertised. So we'll flip over here to Virtuous proper. So first off is the new receipt editor. Now those of you who have been around Virtuous for a while know that our receipt editor has gone through a few iterations. We wanted to try to make it as easy as we could, as broadly applicable as we could. There's a lot of different approaches to how you do receipting across different organizations. Uh, and uh, as part of that, you know, this has continued to evolve. So now we've got a new editor. And when we say we've got a new editor, we're specifically talking about for mailed receipts. So for generating your PDF receipts. So let's call this our May webinar receipt because I'm running out of names. And since we're gonna do this as though we're receiving our gifts for the day, we're gonna go ahead and do this for single gift per receipt. Sorry if you hear some background noise here, I had to shift a cord out of the way. I'm sure that doesn't sound terrible to me, but sounds awful to you. Uh, there we go. Uh, and that'll take me into this new receipt editor here. Uh, and the new receipt editor has a new toolbar up here at the top some new tools for being able to add in tables and add in images. 
Uh, and one of the biggest changes here, in addition to making this just a little bit more user friendly in terms of being able to type in and uh, add whatever you need to add, if I wanted to add my logo at the top, for example, um, before, right, if I wanted to do that, then I would have to have a, a source URL for my logo, right? I had to be able to do that. I had to go uh, find how the logo was presented on my website, for example, and then I could go ahead and add that in here. And, and that's tricky, to be frank. Uh, so now you have the additional option to upload an image. So you can browse for that image on your machine. You can upload that to put in your logo or whatever image it is that you wanna put in. You do have the ability to set some of the spacing around that, right? And you can also go ahead and resize that image right here from the width and the height. You can also resize it once it's added to your receipt template right in here. Uh, you also have your merge tags over here as usual. Uh, but that gift table, for example, if I were to drop that into my receipt at the top, You'll see you have some new table tools here. You can hover to see what each of these means, like delete table, probably not ideal, insert rows, et cetera, so that you can really customize that table a little bit more easily in terms of creating your receipt. Uh, this particular receipt editor is also a little bit more friendly when it comes to directly editing the source HTML, okay? But I will point out that this does require or does uh, strictly enforce some good HTML practices. So if you want to apply some custom styling to your receipt, you're gonna have to put that into the head and not into the body of your receipt template, okay? You can keep that in mind, but it does give you a little bit more flexibility there in terms of editing your receipt. Now, looking at this editor is, is kind of nice because this same editor is what we use for our letters on demand feature. So if you have already used this to edit or modify your existing receipts, good news, right? You don't have a really steep learning curve in terms of having to adapt to a new functionality in order to create or edit a letter once you start working in Virtuous with letters on demand. Okay, uh, so that was one of the big features. Now the other one, yeah, we're fine with that. I don't think I need to save that receipt. It's probably not ideal. Uh, but one of the other big changes is the ability to include video in your email. Now, this bears a little bit of a disclaimer, okay? Uh, because embedding a video in an email is, is really not a recommended practice. Because uh, if you do embed an email, or a video, excuse me, in your email, uh, then you're gonna be dependent on whatever program your recipient uses to open that email as to whether or not they'll actually see that video uh, or maybe it won't work at all, right? So, uh, hey, here's a sample template. We can use that to make a new email and this will be my video email. Woo. Uh, so for that reason, embedding a video, you know, if you wanted to uh, go ahead and use the code block and put in the, the iframe, the embed code for a video and try to do that, you could, but it's, it's not ideal. And again, your recipient may just see a big nothing there in your email. And so the best practice, uh, whenever you want to embed a video in your email has always been to actually add uh, an image, right? Add the, the thumbnail essentially for that video and then manipulate that, add a, a play button, add a fake play button to that email uh, so that that way, you can make it appear as though there's a video, and then you would link that video to the actual email, wherever it lit, or the actual video, excuse me, uh, wherever it lives. If that lives on YouTube, if it lives on Vimeo, great. And then when someone clicks on that play button, it'll pop the video open in a new tab and it'll play the video, and it gives the feeling and the appearance, the, uh, you know, the overall experience of having a video embedded in your email without actually having to embed a video in there. Uh, but that was a lot of steps, right? To have to get the image and add it in and customize it and, and do that sort of thing. Um, it was a lot. And so we wanted to make that uh, a little bit easier so that you can just have a video and then you can pop that thing in right away. And so we did that, right? We've gone ahead and added the ability to embed that video a little bit more easily. So 
here's what we're going to do. We're going to embed a quick uh, virtuous video into this email just so you can see that here. So uh, maybe I decided, hey, I don't need this image block and instead I'd like to use this new video content block. You've seen that pop up in here and I can drag that in and I can drop it right in there. And when I click to edit this, you'll see it says, hey, add your video URL. So I can plug in my YouTube video URL right here. There we go. That's gonna go ahead, it's gonna find that video on YouTube and it's gonna bring it back and it's gonna add whatever the thumbnail is for that video. It's actually gonna add it to your email as an image. So it's not actually embedding the video. It's simply saying, okay, what does this video look like on YouTube or Vimeo, wherever it is? What's the thumbnail for that? What's the image someone sees when they go to play it? And let's just take that image and let's put that into the, to the email. Uh, and then it superimposes a play button on top and depending on the color scheme for the thumbnail on that video, you can change that button to look however you like. So I can make this a round solid, a round outline play button. That's probably a bad choice here given all the white on black text. Right, I can make it a solid rectangle there. I can make it a solid square. I could say, hey, I wanna be kind of minimal. Just give me the arrow. Um, what color do I want it to be? Do I want it to be light or dark? How big do I want that to be? Maybe I want it to be a little bit bigger so it kind of jumps out at somebody. Uh, so I can go ahead and play with that to make that video play button look exactly the way I would like. Okay, and then that's gonna do exactly what I mentioned earlier. It's gonna put that image in the video. It's not gonna put the image in the email. Boy, I need more coffee. It's gonna put that image in your email. It's gonna to link to that video. When someone clicks on it, it'll take them to the page and then they can play the video there, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Vimeo, either way. All you need to do is plug the URL in. So that just eliminates several steps so that that way you can um, you know, sort of Right, I say sort of, embed a video into your email a little bit more quickly. Video is so powerful now, it's so popular right now. There's a lot of data and studies out there in terms of how often people engage with video content as opposed to just written content or email content. So using video is a great tool, right? Again, I just don't want it to literally be in my email, but now you can give the appearance of doing just that. Okay, uh, so that's my email we'll say, we're gonna go back, it'll yell at me and I'll say that's fine. There we go. Uh, and then the other thing that I wanted to mention in terms of new features, and this one's probably a little bit more inside baseball for you admins out there, but uh, is the addition of the pending contacts section here. So if you go into the settings menu, if you crawl around in there a lot, I'm sure you all do, you go to data management. Uh, for a long time now, we've had this view gift transactions section in here. Right? And this is where you can view gift data as it comes into Virtuous in pretty much real time. Right? So uh, if you have gifts coming in through Virtuous Giving or through some other integration, if someone were to call you up on the phone and say, hey, I just was on your website, I made a donation and then my internet went out, did you get it? You could go right to that page and say, yeah, it's here. And then overnight, we'll bundle those into an import for you and the next day you'll import those to Virtuous proper and actually link them with the correct contact records. Uh, but for contact imports or contact updates, we haven't had the same functionality uh, until now. So now you'll see this other section here right next to it where you can view pending contact updates. So whenever someone fills out a virtuous form, right, if they are filling out a lead form, an event form, uh, and that's also, this is gonna to apply to other integrations like our integration with Eventbrite, for example, that sends data over to our contact import tool. You'll be able to see those pending contact updates there, the same way you can see pending gift imports in that uh, other screen. And the nice thing about that is if I go into view pending contacts, and I did clear these out, so I don't have any in here right now, but if I do have any uh, contacts in here that are waiting to be bundled, again, I can wait for them to be bundled at midnight local time for my organization. If I'd really like to work on those right now, then I can always come up here and choose to bundle all of the records that are sitting here in that pending contacts area. Bundle meaning, hey, go ahead, take these and create an import for me, please, because I'd like to import these. Just like with gift transactions, these will be bundled by source. So if I've got some that are coming in from Virtuous Forms, 
some that are coming in maybe from a custom integration that I've built, um, and they're all sitting in the same area. When I bundle everything, that'll create two different imports for me because um, they'll be separated by source. Okay, uh, just a couple of the latest features. And again, don't forget, we do have a new release that is coming out. That release will be happening on Sunday night, okay, this coming weekend. Uh, so if you're going to be taking a long weekend for Memorial Day, when you come back in on Tuesday, you'll see some really, uh, uh, I can't tell you, I'm kind of excited about this release, some really cool new features in there, including, uh, as some of you may have seen in our uh, message in the app today, a new look for uh, the donor overview tab, right? The contact screen. Um, not, a, not an enormous change, but I think a, a good functional change that'll make it a little bit easier to see uh, the data that you need to see. Okay, so given those developments now, we wanted to talk about our featured topic and I started to talk about when email is not enough. And again, I, I don't wanna um, sound like I'm against email, uh, I'm, I'm not, I think it's a pretty good tool, but relying solely on email as the main way to communicate to donors is, is just not the way to go. And I know that everybody doesn't necessarily do that, but I think the trap we fall into very often is that we tend to say, okay, well, I'm gonna communicate with this donor uh, the way that they communicated with me or the way that they gave to my organization. So if someone sent in a check by mail, I'm gonna mail them a receipt and I'm gonna send them direct mail and I'm not gonna email them. And if somebody donated online, be a donation form with a credit card. Hey, they're kind of hip, they're with it, they're tech savvy. So I'm going to send them email and I'm not going to send them direct mail because, you know, they're an online person. And we, instead of creating personas based on what someone is interested in, what they're passionate about, why they care about our organization, and those are the things that really matter, right, to them, we tend to kind of create these personas that are channel based and say, okay, these are my online people or my email people these are my offline or my direct mail people and they don't intersect necessarily when in fact what i want to do again is i want to look at those donor personas a little bit differently hey what are the programs they tend to support right what are the types of campaigns they respond to do they tend to respond most uh, often to peer-to-peer -peer campaigns or peer-to-peer -peer solicitation are those the things that they tend to, uh, to get most excited about? Do they tend to fund most of, our, most of our youth programs because maybe that's the cause they're passionate about? Hey, let me ask them, let me send them a survey. You know, what is it that drew you to our organization so that I know what they're interested in and I know what kind of communication to push out to them. And then when I do communicate with them, I wanna do that across multiple channels. I don't wanna segregate them the mail people and the email people anymore. Okay, so, so why is multi-channel so important? Why, why does it matter, right? Why should I take that time uh, to do that? Well, there's a couple of things. First off, if you look at multi-channel communication, it's gonna boost your response rates, okay? Uh, there was one study that looked at the response rates for direct mail. They had a response rate of about 6% when they added in email right, and they added in additional channels, that response rate went up to 37%. And that makes sense, right? You're giving your donors and your prospects more opportunities to see your message and to see your call to action so that uh, if they miss the email, because email can, can just fly by sometimes, uh, they do see your letter or they do see the blog post on your website, or they do see what you've been posting on social media, so that one of those messages is gonna resonate with them, right? And then you gotta consider the average consumer, and we're all consumers nowadays, even though we're doing more of it at home than ever before, uh, but the average consumer sees about 5,000 or more marketing messages every day, okay? And by the way, there's studies have shown that we can really engage or interact or, or, or really, you know, uh, uh, sort of internalize about 12 of those. So we're doing a lot of filtering. Our brain is filtering out a lot of stuff. So it makes sense. You want to increase your odds, right? Again, have 
uh, a couple of different ways to reach out to and, and connect with your donor, have a couple different touch points with those donors. And, and finally, if you want to be a responsive nonprofit, right, then that means having a single conversation across multiple channels. And that is harder, I don't wanna say it's super hard, but it is a little bit harder to do because it requires really sitting down and, and looking at those donor personas and, and talking about what the donor's journey is going to be and making sure that it's consistent across all of your channels, making sure that your, your direct mail doesn't have a different sort of message or focus than your email does, right? Uh, you want to have the same call to action, the same CTA across all those different channels, okay? Uh, there are different studies that say it's, it takes between, you know, five to 12 times for us to see the same message to really get that message. So asking for one thing in one email, saying, hey, become a volunteer, then following up with a letter that says, hey, please donate, then following up with a social media post that says, hey, please retweet and like us. I'm asking them to do too many different things. I wanna ask them to do the same thing and I wanna ask that just a couple of different ways across a couple of different mediums to make sure that my message is hitting home. That's the idea with being multi-channel. So how do I do that when it comes to automation? Okay, let's go ahead and take a look. So when we talk about automation, we talk about being multi-channel, there's a couple of different ways that you can communicate with folks via automation, right? And again, a lot of times we tend to think about, hey, I wanna send an email. And sending an email makes total sense. Um, you know, uh, I've talked to a lot of people who say, hey, I wanna put together an automation, I wanna send an email out every time someone does X. That's great, right? That's, hey, they do X, I wanna send Y. But remember, automation can do more than that. Automation can say, hey, if you do X, here are all of the things that are going to happen. Here's a whole series of things that are going to happen. And if in response to one of those things, you take the next step, Mr. Donor or Mrs. Donor, then here's the next thing that's going to happen, right? I can really script a much larger journey or a, a much more involved process through automation than simply if A, then B. Okay, and being able to communicate across multiple channels is part of that. It also, to be frank, uh, at a very basic level, it helps because you might not have the same data on everyone. Some people you might have an email address, some people you might have a phone number, some people you have a home address, some people you have all of the above. So if I build an automation that's multi-channel, you know, hey, if I'm missing a phone number for someone, well now I can't call them. I can't use that task, but I've got a couple of other touch points. So I've got some fallback there. I've got some coverage, if you want to think of it that way, in terms of connecting with my donors. So here we're going to go ahead and build, uh, I lost my mouse again. There it is. We're going to go ahead and build a workflow and we're going to call this just our uh, new donor. Uh, thank you. Right. Um, let's capitalize here and we're going to call it our multi-channel. New donor, thank you. Now, I'm gonna try something a little bit different on this webinar, just so you all know. A lot of times I tend to do this, uh, what I call cooking show style, where I kind of show you a couple different steps and then I go, and voila, here's a cake that we've already pulled out of the oven, fully baked. But I wanted to walk through and just build a very simple workflow with you guys uh, on the webinar so you can kind of see uh, what goes into it. Um, so we're not gonna build out something that has, you know, four or five different steps to it. Um, but I, I did want to walk through that process because I think that does sometimes help to see all that visually. Okay, so here we're going to make the decision to have this run seven days a week just because. Now, I know a lot of times, especially if you're doing an email automation or you've got a lot of emails in there, it can be helpful to say don't run on Sundays or, or don't run on weekends entirely because the whole purpose with my automation, my workflow is I want people to feel they're getting that personal touch, that personal attention that, that only my major donors really get. Um, but I don't have the time to do that for everybody. I can't sit down and write a personal email to everybody who donates $10, but I, I want them to have that experience. And so I use automation as a way to do that right? And I want them to feel like I sat down and I opened up Gmail or Outlook and I sent them an email and nothing's going to shatter that illusion of personal attention, like getting an email at 6.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning, 
right? Un unless you work those kinds of hours, in which case, you know, hey, uh, to each their own. But um, that's why you could opt to say, hey, look, don't run it on weekends, only run it on weekdays. I, I really want to preserve that feeling of an employee sat down and they sent you a note to say thank you. Okay. Uh, and in this case, we're going to run this against all records. We're just looking at everybody who becomes a donor. I don't care if you've been in my database for six years, you've been a volunteer. If you just took the next step and decided to make a financial gift for the first time, I still want to celebrate you. The same way I would celebrate someone who is brand new and just went to my website and decided to give for the very first time. Okay. Uh, and uh, we're not going to allow re-enrollment because this idea here is this is a new donor. Thank you. And you're only a new donor once, right? That's it. You only get one of those. So we'll go ahead and save that workflow. So now here we are. I've got a blank workflow. I've got nothing going on here. So I'm going to have to add a step. I'm going to add one step in here. And this step is going to be my uh, new donor step. I apparently can't capitalize the letter N today. I apologize. And so we're going to say this is the my new donors query right here. We're going to save that step. Now, if we want to look at this my new donors query, if you're curious, uh, what are we doing? How are we identifying those new donors? Uh, here's what it is. Okay, so I'm building this as though I'm going to turn this workflow on today. And so I've decided to draw a line in the sand and say, hey, anybody who gives their first gift after today, they can go through this workflow. Again, they're only going to go through it once, so they can't be re-enrolled, right? But I want someone whose first gift date happens after today. And I've also got this second qualifier in here that says that their life to date plus pass-through gift count is one. And that's an important distinction here. Because you want to remember that every donor can have both a first gift date and a first pass-through gift date. So I'll give you an example. Let's say there's a donor who's in my database right now. They gave their first gift a year ago. They wrote a personal check for 250 bucks. So their first gift date is before 521 2020. They don't meet that criteria. They wouldn't be enrolled. But they have a donor advised fund, right? Set up with uh, let's say Fidelity Charitable. They give a gift through their donor advised fund next week. Well, that means that their first pass through gift date is greater than 521 2020. So even though they are not a new donor, right? If that was my only criteria, my only data point, they would get picked up by this by this query, but because I've got this other data point here for their life to date plus pass through gift count is one. Sorry, my circling is a little rusty there. Um, that means, hey, they wouldn't get picked up by this because if they give a second gift, a pass through gift, their life to date plus pass through gift count is two. So they don't get picked up by this workflow at all. Okay, so that's, that's why our query is structured the way that it is. I know that so many times building a workflow is, is, is not a challenge in and of itself. The workflow is not a challenge. It's, it's the queries, right? It's, it's getting that right to make sure you got the right people in your workflow. So that's, that's what we're doing to approach this in terms of building this new donor workflow. Now, I'm going to add in some actions here because I want to celebrate this donor when they give. So I'm going to add in my first action here. And right off the bat, I do want to send them an email because again, sending emails, still not a terrible thing to do at all, right? And so maybe I want to send this uh, thank you for all that you do email. Fantastic. Um, I don't need to customize the sender. I feel pretty good about it, right? Maybe I'm going to make sure I send it to the primary and secondary individuals. That way, if I've got a household, I want to send it to both spouses, okay? Uh, and again, I don't want to have this show up at, you know, 5 or 6 a.m. I, I want this to appear a little bit more personal. So I can come in here and say, hey, I'm going to send this out at, uh, you know, 9. Let's make it feel really, you know, not at the top of the hour or anything. So send it like 9, 15 a.m. And we'll save that. Great. And for that thank you email, that, again, should be a really simple email. Not over-designed, not looking like, 
a newsletter with a fancy background and a, anything else, maybe put your logo at the top and write a really simple, hey, thank you so much. Support from donors like you is how we're able to do what we do and serve the people that we serve. And without you, it just wouldn't be possible. We really appreciate that support. Sincerely, whoever I am, and that's it, right? That, that really can resonate more than a super duper glossy, fancy email. Um, one trick, I think I've mentioned this on a past webinar, but I, it bears repeating. I thought it was a great idea. This actually comes from Noah Barnett. He's our director of community and partnerships. Some of you probably know who he is. Um, he has talked before about how when he had to write emails like this to make them feel more personal, he would intentionally write them on his phone because that just kind of got him into a mode of, of uh, naturally being more conversational, right? Um, and not being too flowery for lack of a better term. That's a great way to do it, to make sure it does feel like a personal note and then just put that into that email. Fantastic. Now, the other thing that I want to do here, the second thing I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to send a letter as part of this workflow, okay? Um, and when I do that, I can come in here and add an action. And when I do that, that's going to be my letters on demand action. So let's take a look at the letters on demand functionality. So we'll leave this workflow where it is. We'll come back to it here. We're going to go over to the virtuous marketing side. We've been hanging out on the CRM side. Uh, and here I got this little piece of paper. That's the letters on demand feature. I've got some letters in here already. We're going to go ahead and create a new one. So I can go up here to actions. I can create either a letter or a postcard. I'm a big fan of the postcards. They're a great way to celebrate things like milestones, right? Instead of getting a big two-page letter in the mail to say, hey, you've been a donor for three years now. Go you. Or even better, happy birthday. It's your birthday, right? Uh, Sending a little postcard that just says happy birthday from all of us, thumbs up, that's great. And again, it, it feels more personal. Someone's connection to you as a nonprofit is inherently more personal than their connection to their dentist or, or their, uh, their doctor's office or, or their car mechanic. Now, there are exceptions there, right? Hey, car mechanic's your brother, good for you. But most of the time they're not going to have the same emotional connection to those businesses. But I'll tell you, every year on my birthday, I get a text message from my car mechanic. I get a text message from my dentist's office. I get a phone call from the dealership I bought my car from several years ago, right? And, and I, I, I don't have a vested interest in those guys. But nonprofits that I support, I would love to hear from them on my birthday. So to get a quick postcard that just says happy birthday, Fantastic. Sending an email is good. Sending an email to say happy birthday. It's your birthday. Yay. But again, I'm going to get like 10 emails in my inbox on my birthday from every other service. I don't get postcards from those guys by and large. Right. So that's a great way to stand out. Here we're going to create a letter. We want to say thank you. Great. And we're going to call this our uh, webinar. Thank you letter. There we go. Now I do have the option here to include a reply device if I would like, and when I do, I can specify, hey, what page number is that reply device gonna be on? Because then we're actually gonna have a perforation for someone to tear off that reply device at the bottom of your letter, right? So that's gonna be super easy to do. You just say, hey, I do want a reply device and it's gonna be on page two. Great, page two is now perforated for you, okay? Um, here, let's say I'm not going to include a reply device. I don't want that look right out of the gate. I want them to get a letter where the entire focus is to say, thank you, excuse me, thank you, you rock. There we go. I can select a segment if I want to associate this with a segment code, with a campaign, with a communication, right? I'd want to do that uh, if I'm using a reply device, if I'm sending this as an appeal, certainly, right? And I'll say, and I've said this before, Anytime you send out any communication, there should be some way in there for someone to respond with a donation, right? Even if the call to action is not give us your money, the call to action is here's an update from the, from the field or please attend our event, please follow us on Facebook. Somebody should still have a way to say, you know, I like those guys. I haven't donated in a while. Let me go ahead and click and, and, and donate or tear this off and send it back and donate. So, you know, generally speaking, it's good to have that. Here, I'm, taking a, a, I'm making a very uh, a, a deliberate, excuse me, decision to say, okay, this is the one piece of mail I'm going to send out where there isn't a reply device. 
I just want to say thank you. That's all. So then I'll hit next. And now the neat thing is you can choose a template. So we've got some templates that are built into the system for you that you can modify. Uh, and then if I am thinking, you know what, I, I, I kind of have my own deal here. I'd like to create my own. There is a link here to create your own HTML. It does require, um, in a lot of cases, customizing some of the HTML. Now I'll give you a little insider tip here. Um, one of the things you can do sometimes, let's say you have a really nice letter you've put together in Microsoft Word, and you'd like to send that out through here. Well, in Microsoft Word, there is a way for you to download your document as an HTML file. And then you could copy the HTML and you could paste that in here. You have to make a few changes, but if you've already got that design and you really dig it, you can take that paste it in if you're doing a blank, uh, you're not selecting a template, you're just creating your own HTML. And then again, make a few changes. You can, you can look at the preview and then you can use that as your letter. Now here I'm gonna do this two page simple letter. Again, I don't want this to be over designed. I don't want a banner and a couple different images and anything else. If I did put an image in here, probably the only thing I'd want to put in is something like, hey, here's a picture of our team. All of them are so psyched that they wanted to, you know, say thank you. Maybe a bunch of people waving or something like that. And you can see, as we mentioned earlier, we're now back in that same editor we were looking at as the new receipt editor. Here it is, right? And up here, this human fund logo, that's our fake human fund logo there. Um, that's in here as an image. And just like in the receipt editor, I can resize that right from here if I want to. If I want to make it bigger or smaller, I can play around with it. I can right click and then click on image and that'll take me in here to those same settings. I can see where it's coming from. I can edit the width and the height, right? I can go in here to the advanced settings and I can monkey with that. I can also just delete it and then add in my own logo, which I would say is what you want to do 100% of the time. I don't think anyone wants to send out a letter with the human fund logo in it, probably not a, a great look, but we can do that. Then here we've already got some sample text in here to say, hey, thank you so much. You could choose to just say, hey, this kind of layout makes sense. I'm gonna replace some of this instead of talking about the human fund with my organization and some bullets about what we do, right? Uh, and then on the second page, right? Again, this is a great place to put in something like, thank you once again. And like, here's a picture of the team all giving you a thumbs up. Really great place to be able to do that. Now, if I wanna come in here and change some things, maybe I don't like this uh, logo on page two, or maybe I like this thank you once again, but I've replaced the logo and I wanna use my colors, my color scheme for my organization to edit this. Well, I can come in here to my tools and I can say, I'm gonna change that font color to whatever color I want to. Pretty easy to edit those colors in here. You even have the ability to come in here to a color picker and you could plug in the hex code. So if you've got the hex codes for your colors from the marketing team, you can do that. If you've got RGB colors, you can do that. Or you can literally just play around with the slider here, try to match your color if you want to. Whatever's gonna be the easiest thing for you to do to manipulate those colors. On some of the other templates where you saw that banner, you can do the same exact thing to edit the color of the banner to match your logo and your color scheme to create your letter. You've got your list of merge tags up here that you can drop in. They're actually the same merge tags that are available in emails. So if you've already created some emails for your workflow and you're thinking, gee, I'd like to take some of that text and, and use that in an actual letter, great. You can do that because we use the same uh, merge tags here that we do in email, okay? And then from here, in my actions, I can save this and get a preview right? I can send a sample. So if I'd like to say, look, I, I, looking at a PDF of this is swell. I, I, it's great, but I, I need to see it. I need to, I need to have that piece of paper in my hands and know what's going to happen when it shows up in my, in my donor's mailbox. You can actually come in here and say, okay, I'm going to send a sample. You're going to have to select a contact. Okay. Now, uh, a lot of you are probably also in your virtuous database as a contact. I know a lot of folks uh, you know, support the organizations where you work. 
So you'd have to do that. You have to select your contact record or the contact record of a staff member. If there are no staff members, you'll have to create one. The reason we do this is because we wanna give you an actual accurate test. How are the merge fields gonna get populated from a contact record when you send that letter, okay? You can go ahead and do that. Uh, and then you can send a test letter to yourself. There are some uh, costs associated with sending that letter, but it's just a single letter. Uh, I say that only because I wouldn't recommend sending a test letter to you know, 30 people in your office. Probably not ideal. Send it to one person and bring it to work whenever everybody's back in the office again. Uh, now you'll notice that whether I come up here and say save and preview, or whether I wanna move forward down here at the bottom, either way, it's gonna have me move forward and review that mail template. And when I review it, it's actually gonna show it to me the way that it will appear when it shows up in my donor's mailbox, okay? And that means it's gonna have things like the address printed on it and the barcode and my return address printed on it. It's gonna have everything in here so that this looks just like it will when it shows up in someone's mailbox. I can download this and print it out if I wanna see it, okay? This return address, you'll notice I never set that up. That's set up in the settings for letters on demand. So it's just there, I don't have to do it each time, okay? Uh, but then if this looks good, if that's really, uh, that's how I wanna roll there for my webinar thank you letter, I can go to next and I can say, I'm good with that. I wanna save it and I wanna publish it. Just like with email, you do have to publish your letter. And if you come in to edit that letter, if I come in to change it later on, I'm gonna to have to publish those changes to make sure that the current version of that letter that I want to be going out is the version that's being used by my workflow. Okay, so now we'll come back into our multi-channel new donor thank you. And now I can add it in action. And on the same day that I send that email, I'd like to get this letter sent out. So I'm gonna send a letter and it's gonna be my webinar thank you letter. There's all the letters that I can choose from there. And then I can add that in. Okay, so that letter is then gonna be sent and it'll be sent out the next three to five days. There's nothing you have to do. I don't have to print it. I don't have to lick an envelope or uh, you know, put everything in zip code order and take it to the post office or anything like that. You're just gonna add it to the workflow. And then when this runs, that letter is gonna get sent. We have fulfillment centers that are around the country that are gonna print that letter out, put it into an envelope and they're gonna mail it to that donor. And so then maybe I'll put in a delay here. I'll delay for, uh, well, let's say about three days, give them a little time. And then I can come back here with a task. Again, I wanna have multi-channel here. So this would be my new donor uh, welcome call where I can call them, get to know a little bit about them, a little bit about what makes them tick. Fozzie Bear, he's great with people on the phone. I can have him do that. I'll set my days till due. So how far in advance is this task created? I like to set this with a minimum of two, right? I don't wanna have this say, hey, the task is created today and it's due today. That's, that's not really fair to Fozzie. I wanna give him about two to three days. Two is a pretty good minimum. I'll say three here just to be safe for him to make that call. And then I'll maybe delay for another couple of days here, right? Um, and then I can follow up uh, maybe with another email. Maybe that email is gonna be one where I can ask them to tell me a little bit more about them. Hey, why is it that you wanted to give to us? Again, we talked about that at the beginning. Hey, what makes you tick, right? What, what is it that drew you to our particular mission or our particular cause? Why is it that you felt this was something that you were passionate about? And then after another delay, I could go back and send another letter and maybe that letter is gonna be an ask for this person to take the next step and become a recurring donor, right? Maybe I have a couple more touch points before I get there. But by building an automation that works across these different channels, again, you get a much better opportunity of you know, getting through to your donor, just in terms of the, the, the basics of, hey, what, what contact data do you have for them? Uh, and in terms of you know, modern attention span, you got a much better chance that they're gonna respond to one of these particular touch points, okay? So it can be really a, a powerful tool. Now again, if I wanna do something like uh, set up another automation, 
where I just want to send someone a birthday postcard or a donor anniversary postcard, I can do that as well. When I go into letters on demand, that would be just creating a postcard here, right? And this could be my uh, happy birthday card. Great. And you'll see that this is a little bit different here because you're going to have to design both the front and the back of your card. Okay. So I can choose a template. This first one on the left, it just says happy birthday, got some text and a background color. On the right, this is actually just an image on the front. So just a, a picture. Maybe I create a picture that has some text in it. That's great. Right. It says, hey, you're, you're the best or whatever. Uh, and then on the back of each of these is where I'm going to have some more text. Okay, and this will walk you through both the front and the back in terms of creating that template. So let's say that I want to do this happy birthday one here. Fantastic. But uh, this is a little bit uh, a little bit fancy for me, let's say, right? Uh, so I can come in here and say, hey, that font, that's, that's not really me. Uh, I want to do something a little bit simpler. Maybe I'll just do this like Tahoma font. It's a little bit more straightforward. Maybe that's not fancy enough. I can do my format here and I can play around with however I want this to look. I'm gonna do Helvetica, go for it, right? I can come in and I can edit things like the background. So if I right click here, I can edit that and I can set a new background color. If I click on this, then that'll let me again come in here and pick a color, customize a color. Maybe again, I wanna do a nice blue there. I can do the same for the border color, Right, so I want to do that same blue maybe, or maybe I want to do a little darker blue around the edge. Ooh, that looks neat. I can change the message on here if I want to, but I, can, I generally want to keep that front simple. Then when I click next, it's going to take me to the back of the card. And here's where I got this. We just want to take a moment and say happy birthday. And again, here I can edit this font. I can match what I did on the front. So I'll come in here and we'll do this, uh, what do we say, Helvetica there. Great. I can edit the color there real quickly. Just right click and pick that lighter blue. Here, again, this is just an image. I can swap that out for my logo or do whatever I need to there. And then when I go to review, it's gonna do the same thing that we did with our letter, right? It's gonna show me a rendering of, hey, how's this gonna look when it's got the address and the barcode and everything else. So what is your donor gonna get in the mail? All right, so that's gonna be a lot nicer uh, way to celebrate them on their birthday, right? Again, a good way to stand out. Okay, so let's say we feel good about that. We can go ahead and save that. And then I could use that to build a happy birthday automation to celebrate some of my donors. And remember for those things like happy birthday in a, a release, actually there's a couple of releases go now, we did add some new options in individual queries. Okay, so if I just type in birth, you're gonna see all these different options, birthday, birth month, birth year, and then birthday all is one word. For doing an automation like this, I wanna use the birthday field, okay? Cause that's where I can say matches. So for example, if I'm doing a postcard, I'd wanna say one week from now. So that means, hey, if someone's birthday is coming up in a week, let's get that postcard in the mail to them so that hopefully they get it on or around their birthday. Right. If I'm going to do an email and I want it to hit on the day of their birthday, birthday matches today. Happy birthday. And again, multi-channel, nothing wrong with doing both. Let them get an email from you on their birthday and send that postcard to say happy birthday and celebrate them. Same for a giving anniversary. Okay. I am, uh, I feel terrible. I went a little bit longer than I intended there. I didn't see too many questions coming in and, uh, Hey, if you give me time, I'll fill it up. I'm like a goldfish. I'll uh, take up as much space as I'm given. But I do want to make sure we do have some time to address some of the questions that came in. One of them was just referencing a recording of this webinar. And yes, as we mentioned at the top, this will be available on the Training Academy page if you'd like to go back to it and see it at another time. Uh, and we had another question here about letters on demand, not seeing the icon in your CRM. Uh, so letters on demand is an additional feature. So if you have automation to be able to send emails and uh, tasks, set tasks and manage uh, organization groups and things like that, um, you may have that, but not the letters on demand feature. That is something that you'd want to talk to your virtuous rep about um, to be able to add in to your account if you don't have it already. Um, and I'd say it's certainly something you can reach out to our support team on 
they can take a look at your account and see, hey, should you see it? Do you have it? Or is it something where you would need to talk to your representative to find out more? Okay. Um, so uh, we have another question here. It looks like, so those two questions came in through the chat. Sorry, I'm trying to balance the chat and the QA. Q&A here. Uh, we did have another question that came in about where the postcards or letters on demand originate from physically. Um, again, there are multiple centers that are located around the country. So there's not just one fulfillment center where they're going to get printed uh, and mailed. It'll come from whichever center is closest to the address that that's being sent to. Uh, and so they'll typically arrive again within about three to five days. And you'll actually be able to see updates on when the letter is sent, when it's in the mail, and when it's delivered on a contact record in the communication history. Just like you can see if they opened an email or clicked on an email, you'll see when they got that letter. That'll all be there on the contact. Okay. Uh, looks like that's it for questions. We were a little light on questions this week. Uh, I know we had a ton of questions uh, this week, this month. We had a ton of questions on our last webinar, so maybe we exhausted a lot of those. Or maybe everybody's feeling more comfortable with Virtuous, which, I mean, that would be great. Um, hopefully that's the case. So uh, I do want to remind everybody that this is something that we do once a month, every month, as I've alluded to earlier. And I want you all to make sure that you do mark your calendar so you can join us at our next training webinar that is going to be on Thursday, June 18th, always at 3 p.m. Eastern. We're going to talk about how healthy your data is, right? How healthy is your database? And we'll have a, a look at some new tools that you'll learn about shortly um, that you can use to make sure that your database is ready for automating your outreach, because that can sometimes be the thing that can hold you back. I'd love to do this, but I don't know if uh, I have addresses I can rely on. I don't know if I have email addresses I can rely on. Uh, so we'll take a look at some strategies to do that. And don't forget, mark your calendars because on the third Thursday of every month, that is when we do this, same that time, same that channel. I did just see a question come in asking about creating a task for lapsed donors who give a gift. Absolutely, you can do that through automation. Um, I'll say one of the things to bear in mind, see, never ask a trainer a question. He'll go off and, and even you know, break what he's doing here. Um, but one of the things to keep in mind, if you want to reach out to lapsed donors who give a gift, and this actually goes back to something we talked about in our last webinar. We talked about everything you were afraid to ask about automation. We looked at some of the things that can derail your automation, right? And one of those things is to invalidate your own query. Okay, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So let's just go into the query tool briefly here. Uh, if I can. Oh, come on, I'm not ready for that. We're not talking about fancy inspirational quotes yet, people. But I can't seem to get to my browser. Hold, please. I'm not sure why. There we go. It's always an adventure whenever I'm doing a PowerPoint. You'd think I'd be used to it by now. But uh, if you were going to build a query to identify lapsed donors who give another gift, here's the trick. Okay, so I, I'd want to have a contact query because that would be a contact workflow, right? And so I might be tempted to say, well, hey, I want to find anybody who's a lapsed donor who gives a gift. So give me everybody where their tag is any of lapsed donor and their uh, last gift date, right, is after, say, last Sunday. Great. That seems like a pretty straightforward way to do it. Unfortunately, though, this is never going to work. Uh, some of you might already see why. The problem here is I'm depending on the tag of lapsed donor, but the minute someone gives that gift, they're no longer a lapsed donor, right? So. If someone did give a gift after last Sunday, they are by definition uh, not going to be lapsed unless, right, they also have missed a recurring gift payment or a pledge payment somewhere along the way. That means I'm really depending on a few things that may or may not happen. Probably not ideal. 
Okay. So if I do want to identify those lapse donors who just gave a gift uh, so that I can go, hey, woohoo, welcome back to the fold or, or whatever. And remember, by the way, just as a brief aside, a lapsed donor by and large does not think of themselves as lapsed, right? They give to you uh, around abouts once a year, every year, close to whatever time. And so if it's been just a little bit over a year and they send in a check where you're thinking, man, you came back to us, woo. They're like, I never went away. I've been reading your newsletters. I've been following you on Facebook. I gave somewhere around last year and then I just gave again. You know, they don't, they don't have that same mindset. So you do want to be careful. We want to celebrate them for, for making that contribution, but without framing it as, you know, the prodigal donor has returned, right? That's a little bit tricky. So if I want to build this query, uh, the way that I would structure this is to say that I want anybody whose last gift date was after last Sunday, right? If I want to have a longer tail on this, we already know, we talked about this in the last session. I could say something like after 30 days ago, if I'm going to have a cycle of emails that takes longer than a week. Uh, and then I would say that their uh, rolling year plus pass-through gift count is one. Okay. That means, hey, they just gave a gift in the last 30 days and they've only given one gift in the last 12 months. That is going to give you a much better way to try to identify those lapsed donors. And if you want to add an additional parameter on there, right, to say, hey, I want to go back even further than that, you can even go into their previous rolling year plus pass through gift count. Okay. Um, but that is going to give you someone who's only given one gift in the last 12 months and it happened in the last 30 days. That's a much better way to identify those lapsed donors who have just given again. That was a great question. Okay. So again, please do remember to join us next month. We just had a question here. Where do I find a definition of what the fields mean, such as rolling year? You can find that in our support section, right? We've got our How to Speak Virtuous Glossary. And then we also have an entire article that is on a definition of all the different statistics that you'll see in Virtuous, okay? Uh, can't seem to get my mouse functioning again, so I apologize. Let's see if we can get it back. Nope, can't quite get to that support page, but uh, you'll see it there in our support section. There is an article that defines all of the contact statistics. And that'll tell you things like, hey, what does previous rolling year plus pass through gift count actually mean? Okay. All right. So one last thought to leave you guys with. I always try to do this every month, right? Uh, this is from Julia Campbell. Some of you may know her. She is a, a speaker. She speaks at a lot of conferences, AFP and some smaller AFP events. Uh, really uh, uh, a leader in the digital fundraising space. Uh, and in terms of multi-channel, she had said, you know, interacting with supporters is never a waste of time, no matter the channel, right? It's not about you. It's about those you serve and the impact you're having. And I think that's a good way to frame this. Again, I don't want to think about how did their payment come in? How did their check come in? What's going to be the cleanest and easiest way for me to just send a, a, a mail to a mailing list and an email to an email list I want to think about really reaching out to my donors based on their personas, their interests across multiple channels. Much better way to frame it. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. And I will talk to you again next month.